And at this point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Chris Wong with the Center for Public Policy Innovation. And he's going to be introducing our uh, next distinguished keynote. So take it away, Chris. Great, thanks, Megan. I, I appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Long. I'm the president of the Center for Public Policy Innovation. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. We've got a great group, a great uh, speakers, and, and over 360 participants uh, as part of our turnout today. So I'm really, we're all really thrilled. Uh, the Center for Public Policy Innovation, for those who don't know, we're a 501c3, we're a, th a think tank dedicated to fostering collaboration between industry, government, and Capitol Hill on issues related to emerging technology, innovation, global competitiveness, and the creation of jobs for the new economy. Uh, CPPI is uh, proud to host today's webinar on hybrid cloud in, in the government in association with the Homeland Security Dialogue Forum. And like I said, we've, it's, I've been really enjoying the program. Um, I want to also uh, be remiss not to thank our business partners today, Oracle, McAfee, Dell Technologies, uh, Kerasoft, and Google Cloud for making today's event possible. So, you know, with that, um, I'd like to uh, keep the program moving and I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, uh, a man, a leader who's well known to our community, a veteran of the industry, a man who's been a champion of the government and federal contracting community and federal IT modernization for nearly two decades, Congressman Jerry Conley. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Chris. It's great to have you with us, sir. I, uh, you know, we, I hope you've had a chance to listen in a little bit. And, um, you know, we're going to get you some notes about the program. A lot of, a lot of good thought leadership taking place today. Sure. Well, let me let me just say a few nice things about you, uh, and then uh, I'm going to turn the uh, microphone. Take your up. time, Chris. What's that? I said, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot I could say. Um, first of all, you're my congressman and my friend, and I'm honored to have you here. And uh, beyond that, I, I'd say you know you really are one of the the people in Congress who understands the challenges associated with maintaining our industrial base with. Uh, 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 migrating to a modern infrastructure and in, 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 in the federal government and all the advantages that come with that. Um, you know, since being elected in 2008, uh, you, it, you've been to Virginia's 11th district. You represent many of the folks who are online today. Uh, there were a lot of your constituents. Um, as a senior member of the House Oversight Committee and chairman of Government Operations Committee, uh, you've been able to use your, your platform very effectively on behalf of the industry and the nation. Um, you know, we, as you know, but in case others don't know, uh, you've co-authored the bipartisan, and I get this right, the Conway ISA Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act, FITARA, and, uh, and presciently helped pass the Telework Enhancement Act, which we... Uh, uh, which increases the use of telework during emergencies, which has uh, really come into play here in the last few months during the pandemic. Um, prior to your service in Congress, of course, you were uh, at the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisor and an executives in the industry with SAIC and SRI International, to name a few. And uh, again, thank you, sir. It's an honor to have you with us. And at this point, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you so much and to the center for sponsoring today's event. Um, it's my honor to join you. You know, we're, we're in the midst of three crises. Uh, first, we have a public health crisis, the worst since the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic. And we're kind of back to 1918. There's no treatment and there's no cure. There's no preventive, there's no vaccine. And that is a very strange place to be in 2020, and yet that's where we are. And that required uh, social distancing and quarantining and shutdowns to try to stop the spread of the virus. That worked, but when you reopen, especially if you reopen without a lot of guidelines and care, uh, the virus is right there waiting, waiting to pounce back, and we're seeing that in uh, well over a dozen states in the United States, some states that were not very careful about reopening uh, and were kind of 
uh, you know, braggadocio about reopening, like Texas and Florida, are now seeing the highest daily rates of infection they've ever experienced. Uh, and that's very alarming. Those are two very big states. And the same is true for Arkansas and Alabama, and South Carolina. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're very worried about returning to where we were after having flattened the curve and lowered the mortality uh, rate in the United States. So let's hope that doesn't happen. But uh, from an epidemiological point of view, it's almost certain to happen, uh, at least in, in those states that haven't taken precautions. Um, and, uh, you know, at least 2 million Americans plus have been infected officially. We know that unofficially lots of people weren't diagnosed for lack of testing. Um, and, uh, and at least 116,000 Americans have died. Uh, probably that number is higher also because there are a lot of excess deaths reported during this time period. Uh, the lion's share almost certainly are attributable to COVID-19, but they weren't diagnosed. Uh, we have found huge weaknesses during this pandemic, um, and I'll return to one of them, the IT systems, uh, and how important they are and how badly we did. But our supply chain was uh, broken. Uh, we are overly reliant on China and some other countries, a handful of them, for critical supplies and drugs. And when the pandemic started in China, China got real careful about exporting PPE, personal protective equipment, and drugs. <clears throat> and as a result, we found ourselves short. Um, we were worried about a surge capacity at hospitals. We were very short of PPE, personal protective equipment, which put medical workers, nurses, and doctors and technicians at risk and indeed, many of them, of course, contracted the virus because they didn't have enough protection. Um, we, uh, we also saw weaknesses in the national stockpile, which was not sufficiently equipped. Uh, and there was no real national coordination. So literally, localities and states were bidding against each other to try to get the equipment the federal government didn't have or wouldn't give. And when the federal government through FEMA did distribute this equipment, it did it in a very haphazard way. Um, you know, for example, my state of Virginia initially only got 7% of its first re big request, while Mississippi was getting 120%. So there was no rhyme or reason. There, were no, there was no prioritization of, for hotspots and hospitals that were really stretching in terms of capacity. And then, of course, there was the testing fiasco. So WHO developed a test that worked, and it offered that test to us. And we said, no, we wanted an American test. Um, in fact, Dr. Burks stood by the president and proudly said, we want a made in America test. We're not going to use the WHO test that works. So we lost a month in developing our own test. And when we did develop it and distributed some of it, not a lot of it, uh, it didn't work. It failed. And so we lost another month trying to fix it. So we lost two full months while the virus spread without testing. So we didn't really have an accurate picture of where is it? Are there hotspots? Can we isolate? Can we take protective measures? And the virus continued uh, its relentless pace and lives were lost. Um, it is estimated that we could have saved maybe upwards of 80% of those who in fact died if we'd acted sooner. That's a terrifying and really troubling statistic. So on every level, we failed. We were not prepared. Um, CDC did not cover itself in glory. FDA sometimes made some decisions that were not particularly scientific, one of which was uh, on an emergency basis approving hydroxychloroquine as a possible uh, treatment. Well, they've now pulled that approval and announced that it's not efficacious and that could be harmful. The reason they gave it emergency approval, of course, was because the president personally said, I think this might work. You ought to try it. What have you got to lose? Well, you could lose your life, apparently, because if you have any underlying cardiovascular condition, it can actually aggravate that to the point of heart attacks that are fatal. Uh, other than that, yes, you've 
got nothing to lose. Um, one of the, uh, then of course we have the economic collapse. And, you know, I don't think we fully appreciate because we're still partially shut down what this means. The GDP is going to contract in double digits. It's going to be the biggest contraction since 1929. Unemployment, uh, first time unemployment claims hit 40, a cumulative amount of 44 million people, far more than occurred uh, in the depression. And of course, that the depression stretched out over 11 years. This is an unemployment uh, spike in less than 10 weeks. We've never seen anything like it. And uh, we've seen at least 50,000 small businesses go under, gone. We've seen some large retail brands gone. Uh, and that's probably just the beginning of a very painful process we're gonna go through in trying to reopen safely. And of course, uh, small businesses, particularly hard hit. Uh, a lot of mom and pop, you know, stores, restaurants, small law firms, uh, and other retail outlets uh, that are, you know, don't have a national brand, aren't necessarily part of a national franchise, really at risk. You know, they have low capital, uh, they have low liquidity, uh, they kind of operate month to month. Uh, they're usually one month behind, in fact, in their operating cost because they don't have a reserve, a cash reserve. Uh, they're really at risk. And the magnitude of this economic turnaround that is so sudden and so deep and sweeping um, has yet to fully be appreciated. But most economists, including Trump's own appointee as chairman of the Federal Reserve, have said, we're going to be a long time recovering from this. It's not going to be some swift recovery. There may be spikes in categories of the economy uh, that make a comeback. But overall, um, I think we're in for a long, hard slog, and we're going to have to address that recovery uh, at some point uh, in the near future. Uh, and then, of course, we have the third crisis, which is about racial justice, the brutal murder of George Floyd with a cop that put his knee on his neck for almost nine minutes, even though he said he couldn't breathe, uh, was a horrifying video and a horrifying event. And it has galvanized public opinion about what, what is going on here that yet another black man is dying at the hands of our police, usually white police officers. Um, and there is a sense, and two thirds of the public would agree with this, we've got a systemic racial problem we've got to address. And there are real problems in law enforcement that are pretty fundamental that need to be addressed and restructuring has to occur. Um, so we've never kind of faced this, you know, triad of crises and challenges um, and one that affects us on this call uh, that we've uh, clearly been concerned about is the role of IT. Uh, and, you know, I've been singing that song for 12 years um, and um, urging government at the federal level anyhow to reinvest, to upgrade, to move to the cloud, to make changes that bring you into the 21st century so that you can be cyber secure, you can be efficient and effective, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, manage large databases. So by not doing that in some cases, we have seen how integral and necessary those changes are and, the, and IT is to the mission and the objective. Examples, um, the Small Business Administration, who would have guessed, but it's kind of front and center in the economic response to COVID-19. And we pumped $750 billion into the Small Business Administration. Now that is 10 or 15 times what the SBA normally spends in a decade. We did it in 10 weeks. And it simply, its IT system known as eTrans simply couldn't handle it. It crashed many, many times, which frustrated people from applying. It made it hard to sort of spread the loan portfolio to new financial institutions, new for SBA, so that we were kind of getting it down to Main Street to the small businesses that really needed it and were the intended beneficiaries. Um, lots of people didn't hear back. 
their application was denied uh, fal you know, falsely uh, because they weren't able to reprogram the new criteria that were much more expansive and much more liberal uh, to try to pump money into the economy and save small businesses. Um, and it was early on a mess. The IRS, uh, we also provided direct payments to every American and every dependent child. And um, when it was direct deposit, IRS was able to do that because it, it's got that down pretty solidly, right? So for those Americans who have direct deposit, you know, our IRS has a, a pretty good system for, you know, tax refunds getting into your account um, or, and or other payments. But uh, that's only about 70 million people. So everybody else is getting a paper check or a debit card and IRS's IT system can't handle that volume. So the most it can handle now is 5 million of those a week, which means that they're gonna to have to stretch out these direct payments that were intended to inject capital and cash into the economy immediately to try to stabilize it. Instead, uh, the last payment will be made sometime in September. That was not the game plan. Uh, and that's entirely because of IRS's inability, because of IT, lack of investment, to handle this volume and this demand. Uh, unemployment insurance, uh, you know, at the federal level, we made a lot of changes. Uh, you know, we added a $600 payment to the weekly unemployment benefit. We extended unemployment benefits by 13 weeks, and we changed eligibility to allow gig workers, sole proprietors, self-employed uh, to qualify for the first time. And again, uh, unemployment this time is managed by the 50 states. So there are 50 different IT systems um, at least a dozen of which still use COBOL. Think about that. So they, they had trouble programming the changes and they, had, they were overwhelmed with demand. They could not handle the demand. And so there are a lot of people who went eight or 10 weeks without receiving that first unemployment check if they got through the system at all in terms of eligibility. Um, and that's unconscionable because again, you know, if you're unemployed and you don't have savings, that unemployment check may be the difference between staying in your home or not, putting food on the table, making sure the kids are okay. I mean, this is really quite fundamental. And, um, you know, uh, the system simply broke down because they hadn't made the investments in IT. And finally, also at the federal level, but other, other places as well, telework. As you cited, Chris, you know, I've been a champion and an evangelist for telework, you know, for a long time, even before I got to Congress. And the key about telework is it provides us with a, a core capability to do, to have continuity of operations in the event we can't physically go to work. Well, right now we can't physically go to work. And the federal government completely failed in that regard as well. There was almost no guidance from OPM the Office of Personal Management. Uh, literally, it was up to individual managers throughout the federal government to kind of make a spot call on their own and hope for the best that they're not penalized or dinged on for making the wrong decision. So some managers said, without guidance, you got to come to work. And by the way, that also meant contractors had to go to work because they're under contract to serve the federal client. And if the federal client's working, we're working. Uh, and it created enormous confusion. Other managers said, work from home. And, you know, I'm not going to put it in writing, but, you know, I don't want anyone being unsafe. And there was enormous confusion. And by the way, that confusion continues because when OPM was asked to issue guidance about reopening, if you read that memo, it, it, I, I, I challenge you to figure out what are they saying? It, again, it sounds like they're saying, use your own judgment. Well, you know, in the federal system, uh, that puts you as a manager at risk because in fact, it asks you to bear the entire risk and to make the entire judgment. That's not leadership. That's not how the federal um, you know, system ought to work. 
and it's abrogating responsibility. So um, we, have a, we have a long way to go in uh, reaching our goals. I think it underscores why Fatar or Connelly Ice, as you say, Chris, um, is necessary, as are other pieces of legislation to modernize, to streamline, like FedRAMP, like the MGT. Now, in the HEROES Act we passed, I might point out, we uh, bumped up funding for MGT uh, to, to uh, have a capital fund to catalyze agencies to retire legacy systems and invest in new ones uh, from the $25 million appropriation in this current fiscal year to a billion dollars. In the previous bill, we actually had $3 billion, but the Senate wouldn't go along with it. Uh, but it's essential that we, we have that kind of capital fund so that we can really kind of incentivize. Uh, and if we do it at the federal level, we have a fighting chance to try to persuade states after this terrible experience that they need to do the same, especially in key systems like the unemployment system. So I, I think it's kind of exposed real vulnerabilities in supply chains, in distribution uh, uh, procedures, uh, in our IT systems, in our workplace rules and, uh, and safety measures uh, that will have to be examined very carefully when we start to reopen fully and we look at recovery. The rules of the road have to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. That was, that was terrific. I'm glad you got to uh, address the uh, MGT and the Tech Modernization Fund and FedRAMP a little bit. I think those are key issues. And uh, I know we, would, uh, we hope to continue our collaboration together. And if there are things that we can do, ways that we can help bring the industry along to support uh, efforts that you, you're, you'd like to lead, we're, we're there for you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Well, Congressman, you're welcome to stay on. Uh, we have one another panel discussion uh, coming up. Somebody Chris, can I, just, can, I, can I just give one paid uh, yeah, sure. announcement? You said that I have a lot of constituents on this call, and that's wonderful. For those constituents, I want to remind them I've got an election in six days. I hope they will vote. If they haven't already gotten a mail ballot, and uh, which, by the way, is another change. I think we're in our future after this. Uh, they're going to have to vote in person, but uh, it is a very important primary election, um, and uh, there are a lot of values and uh, objectives that are at stake here. So if you can vote, I strongly urge you to participate in the election on the 23rd of June, as I know you did, Chris. Thank, Thank you all so much for having me today, and stay well and stay healthy. I've got another Zoom i got to go to. Thank you. All right. Likewise. Thank you, sir. Thank Bye -bye. you. Wonderful. Hey, that was uh, that was great. Uh, Congressman uh, Conway, it's always great to have uh, with us.